Hello there. Welcome to the Evan Hawk, a podcast discussing Star Wars news and Night's Old Republic. Today we will discuss Boba Fett. Boba Fett? Where? And the allusions to Kotor in the Mandalorian Season 2 premiere. The Marshall, this is where the fun begins. All right, so we're going to get things started off with, with our recent poll that we did where um, you guys had answered our question for music. And that was, what was your favorite song on our podcast? And so just to go over this really quick, um, 50% of you guys had said um, the intro was your favorite. 5% of you said Javar's Cantina was your favorite, and the outro, um, 45% of you said that that was your favorite, so um, I'm going to get things started right away. I uh, I wanted to vote for the outro, but I, I couldn't because the comment box was in the way. Uh, yeah, um, I was able to vote no problem with it uh, for the Bastila's theme, so yeah, our intro is based on the Old Republic theme. Then our transition is the Javier's Cantina theme. And the outro, of course, is the Bastila's theme. The intro and outro, of course, are composed by Alistair Schroeman. And our transition music was composed by Christian Walker. So they really knocked it out of the park. And I think definitely the intro kind of sounds like the beginning of a Star Wars movie. You know, it kind of gets everyone interested and into the era of KOTOR. And then Javier's Cantina is just like a fun cantina bop, you know? Just while you're in between side quests, you know? And then the outro, we kind of wanted something a little deeper, you know? Kind of more contemplative, and uh, we just thought the Bastila theme uh, matched that well. You know, I thought this was a good poll, and... Uh, we we definitely look forward to getting some other work done here in the future. So I think we're already in communication with uh, some revisions as well as some new pieces. So you, everybody has something to uh, look forward with that. Yeah. All right. And before we dive into the Mandalorian Season 2 premiere, I just wanted to take a moment and make a plug to ask you, our beloved listeners, to please review our podcast on apple podcasts subscriptions and reviews and shares really help us out immensely and it helps people find you know like the little overlooked planets you know like tatooine it helps them raise their cred you know and become a little bit more like a a coruscant or a naboo you know just so some good worlds aren't overlooked, you know? So we're just kind of on the outer rim. We're just a simple podcast trying to make our way in the universe. So there's our plug for this week. So we appreciate all of you and all the help you give us. So uh, before we get started, just heads up, everyone. We are going to be spending the rest of this episode talking about Mandalorian Season 2. So if you haven't seen this yet, by the time this releases... The second episode's probably going to be coming out, so... You really should just see, um, have seen it. <laughs> I know, like, so if you haven't seen it, get on it, and then come back. We uh, we look forward to you uh, coming back for the rest of this episode. Um, but we'll give everybody a minute, and then we'll jump right into our discussion on The Mandalorian Season 2. All right, so welcome back those who want to stick around with us. First things first, season two, two starts off as chapter nine. So instead of starting over with chapter one with season two, they're going with a continuation. And it's titled The Marshall and written and directed by John Favreau. Um, and it's a longer episode. It's 52 minutes. So it's a good opener. And we start off on the, uh, is it the graffiti world or do we actually know the planet's name? It doesn't have a name. So what? Everyone's just calling it the graffiti world. It's a cool establishing shot, though. Yeah, so the, the episode gets started with um, Mandalorian. He's investigating for Baby Yoda's kind, and he is informed to, I guess, seek out another Mandalorian that's rumored to be on Tatooine. And I really liked uh, when we returned to Tatooine that Amy Sedaris's Peli Motto reappeared. It was fun to have a return, and... It was kind of funny because um, when she was kind of talking about the child, it seemed a little bit meta, like about the baby Yoda craze, you know? And there was some character development because 
she is like, oh, droid's back up. He doesn't like you. And then the Mandalorian is like, it's okay. I'm over that now. Yeah, after uh, IG-88. I think it was IG-11. Um, is it IG-11? Yeah. I don't know. That confuses me because, you know, like, IG-88 would be, it, like, you know, it would be the newer model. But, I don't know. Okay, IG-11, you know, he, he helps kind of with that with that droid prejudice when he explains to the Mandalorian that, you know, he can see him without his mask because he's not, like, a living human being so he helps him out and i think that definitely uh, helps the mandalorian's views on droids so i don't know one thing that i picked up with this episode and something that i really like about kind of like john favreau's direction is just how much fun the cast has in this whole episode you can kind of tell that everybody just really kind of enjoys the roles and has a little bit of creative freedom to, to kind of like spin it in their own little direction so just with the, uh, the different characters that we're going to talk about that's something that's really evident and made the episode like really enjoyable throughout yeah when he speaks with Pili Motto, she uh, shows him a map of Tatooine and kind of goes over the the Tatooine settlements and points out Mos Pelgo and explains that that's that's kind of like a I don't know like a rundown or a non-existent town according to the kind of the local rumor um, but the Mandalorian decides to go out there anyway because that's where this uh, this mystery Mandalorian is camped out. Yeah, it's so like a ghost we town. Get, yeah, and we get we get a little bit of that when he does arrive, where it kind of reminds us of a old kind of like spaghetti western, like a Clint Eastwood film, of like arriving to a town for the first time, being that stranger, and uh, you know go, goes to the bar, speaks with the. Uh, the bar owner, which you know is the thing to do if you're or a bar if you're tender. new to a dusty town. What's that? You said bar owner. You could just call him a bartender or barkeep. Maybe. I mean, he probably owns that bar. But anyway, so there's there's a lot of really uh, fun kind of spaghetti western callbacks with this with this sequence, and that's where we meet Cobb Vanth, who's played by Timothy Oliphant, and he's a uh, he's got Boba Fett's armor, which is a uh, which is a cool Easter egg. And I liked how we don't take like a huge deviation off of kind of the legends lore of Boba Fett with his inclusion of uh, in the story. Cobb Vanth, he was mentioned in the Aftermath books and it, they said that he is in the Mos Pelgo region and he was wearing Boba Fett's armor. And what I liked is that Timothy Oliphant has a very... He has a tall and lean physique, so Boba Fett's armor doesn't quite fit on him. So when it when he's wearing it, I'm like, that's Boba Fett's armor, but that is no Boba Fett, you know? But when he took off his helmet, that kind of clued you in that he's not really a Mandalorian. He's just wearing the armor. But I was like, oh, Timothy Oliphant, I had forgotten. You know, he, he looks good, you know? And I'm kind of sad that he's been in The Mandalorian because I think he would have made a great Karth or even a good Candorous, you know, but... Something interesting to note, because, like, it took it took a little bit to kind of clue in that that wasn't, like, an older Boba Fett because, well, for one, we didn't know if we got, like, the old actor back for that, but the, like, if, if you follow the Clone Wars lore... The, the Mandalorians in Star Wars The Clone Wars kind of spit on the Fett family as, well, as discount Mandalorians because they talk about how Jango Fett doesn't actually... Well, there's there's two different cases. There's either Jango Fett doesn't have a true set of Mandalorian armor, but he has armor fashioned like Mandalorian armor, or B, he like comes across Mandalorian armor illegitimately... And wears it, but he's not he's not of the Mandalorian tribe, he's not from Mandalore. And and so he's just kind of like a, a bad taste and and like a bad example of kind of the Mandalorian race and and also uh tribe. So it makes sense why like in Star Wars Attack of the Clones, Jingle Fett has his mask off a lot, even when Cobb Vant takes his mask off. I I was expecting that from Boba Fett. As they're they're not true Mandalorians according to the Clone Wars lore. 
Yeah. I mean, there were rumors that Timothy Oliphant was playing Cobb Vanth, so I, I didn't think it was Boba Fett to begin with. And then as Cobb Vanth and Mando are talking, there starts to be a ground quake. I would say an earthquake, but you know, they're not on Earth. And I was like, what's going on? Is this like something to do with the mining? Like, are they fracking or something? I don't know. But then... And I was like, Disney would not do this. They literally would not do this. And then I was like, oh, it's a worm from Dune, you know. But then they're calling it a crate dragon. And I ended up listening to the audiobook of Dune this year. And Dune is a great sci-fi novel. Probably one of the best of all time. It's by Frank Herbert. And... It's probably inspirational for, like, all of modern sci-fi, I would say. Um, and I really do think that Dune and Frank Herbert have not gotten enough credit for the inspiration they've given to Star Wars, because I think the book and the failed adaptation of Dune, Jodorowsky's Dune, that had a lot of art and promotional material made for it that and and then when that fell through it went on to inspire 20th century fox when they were creating star wars so there's a whole lot of like story similarities like desert planets a fallen father a better son you know that i think when i was listening to dune i was kind of like putting a few things together and i was like i i wish that uh, I didn't have to do so much digging to figure out, like, the inspirations that Dune gave to Star Wars, but I'm sure it'll happen eventually, but that was, like, I mean, it is cool to have the crate Dragon become canon and to see the different design, uh, I mean, there's a few different designs, which I, I guess that makes sense. There's some canon ones, some legend ones. And, I mean, that, that does make sense, because if you go to a zoo, like, there's plenty of different kinds of, like, crocodiles, alligators. They're similar, but different. Different kinds of snakes, you know, on a planet. They don't all have to be the same, but that was interesting. So, basically, the, the Mandalorian, he wants, he wants Boba Fett's armor back. And then, so, they strike a deal to take care of the um, crate Dragon. And then he'll have the armor returned. And so they they then team up with the um, the Tusken Raiders, um, who also get the small town involved, and they combat this uh this dragon, which was a really, really cool sequence, I think. Yeah, it, it's definitely a great sequence, and I think Disney kinda learned its lesson is you kind of don't want to have a slow episode. You want to have some action and get people interested, kind of have literally and kind of pun intended, you know, an explosive first episode, you know, and get people talking, create chatter. Yeah, I think the only time, and this wasn't like a bad sequence either, but the only time that the episode kind of dragged for me was when... Um, Cobb Vanth was explaining kind of his origin story of how he came across the Mandalorian armor, but it was definitely necessary, but it was it, to kind of feel a little bit off pace uh, compared to kind of what all the events that led up to that point and then kind of like, oh, and by the way, let's get back to this story uh, forward. Yeah. Um, and uh, also three Banthas were harmed in the making of this episode. No, I'm just kidding. I did. I did watch the credits and there was a notification that no animals were harmed in the creation of this episode so they must have been you know cgi banthas so that was yeah. fun but when they when they blow up the crate dragon you kind of see some parallels uh from the jaw was with the mud horn because the jaw was celebrated with the egg and then the tuscan celebrated with the pearl of the crate dragon and we'll we'll get into that later but it was some nice framing it's like you know it's like poetry it rhymes they killed the crate dragon uh, everybody got what they wanted and they all kind of went their 
separate ways. So we're kind of left with the Mandalorian not getting kind of the information he needs, but he, uh, he does recover a kind of Easter egg artifact. So as the Mando and Child are on the speeder on their way back to the Razor Crest, there's a twin sunset, and it's a peaceful uh, twin sunset. I would say it's not melancholic like Luke's binary sunset, and it's not like, I feel like Anakin's going to commit genocide, you know? It's just a nice, peaceful sunset. And then you see Boba Fett kind of overlooking Mando on the speeder. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's Tamura Morrison. And it's just like enough. He has some Tusken Raider weapons and just kind of wearing a cloak. He kind of gave up his armor. And I was like, I feel like this is kind of passing the baton Boba Fett to Mando, you know, like... Mando is kind of like the the cool Mandalorian now, you know? And the reason why Boba Fett is kind of scarred and missing eyebrows and hair is because he was in the Sarlacc and just the acid kind of makes it so you can't grow hair anymore. So, because I was like, I'm pretty sure that is Boba Fett because Boba Fett was last seen, you know, on Tatooine. And his armor was found... He's on Tatooine. Some people are like, what if it's Rex? I'm like, that's stupid because it's Boba Fett, you know? <laughs> so, oh, my dog joined. He loves me. I confirmed in the credits and I was like, Tamara Morrison. So I'm like, yeah, it's Boba Fett. So it was really cool. I never really believed he didn't survive, but there's always like five people who are like, until it's confirmed in canon, I'm not going to believe it. And I was like, well... It was confirmed. It is confirmed in canon. canon. So the uh, tale of the bounty hunter, the quote unquote legend, um, talks all about how Boba Fett was rescued and nursed back to life. Yeah, Um, I like that this episode wasn't like a play by play of like how did Boba Fett survive? You know, it's like yeah, we're kind of smart enough to kind of put it together. You know, like the armor, Tatooine, he's there. I'm sure it'll be explained someday in more detail, but that's all I really needed was the passing of the baton or the T-shaped visor helmet, you know? So one guess I do have for the future is that Cobb Vanth will be back. He gives the armor to Mando, but I kind of wonder if Mando will ever give the armor back to him, you know? Like he's like, you're an honorary Mandalorian now. We need you more than ever. And... I kind of wonder, I mean, there was a canceled Boba Fett movie. I believe it was going to be the director of the recent Godzilla movies was going to direct uh, Trank, I believe. But then that was canceled. But I kind of wonder if this was ever meant to be a movie or show about Boba or Cobb. What do you think? Uh, You'll have a message for me, a link that was sent to me. It's basically like a, a visual narration of how Boba Fett survives the Sarlacc. It's a little bit conflicting to Tales of the Bounty Hunter, but I mean, it's a it's kind of a fun, like different take, I guess. But uh, it kind of just depends on what canon you follow. With. All right, so let's take a quick break, and we'll come back with um, our final topic regarding the. Easter eggs, and also callbacks for um, Kotor references. My favorite Easter egg for sure was that Cobb Vance speeder was part of Anakin's pod racer. It was missing a little fin, but it had the same sound design, and I'm just like, mm, it just looks good, yeah, that was, sounds good. That was one of my favorite designs that I saw was this speeder kind of made out of the scrap of Anakin's pod. I thought that was awesome looking. Yeah, and the Tusken Raider dogs from Attack of the Clones ended up appearing, so... We also had pit droids, so like the prequel, the prequel fans were definitely served. So those were my favorite. What about you? Like we mentioned, the the pod racer was 
like probably among my favorites. Um, I also loved how like the Boba Fett armor wasn't a perfect fit and it looked really bad on uh, a very good person, on, like very good looking, you know, like I was like, I fell in love with Cobb Vanth, you know, but yeah. I just loved how small the helmet looked on him and how it made his neck look really long. Yeah. Like just that whole image was hilarious. And then I, I think those were kind of like my call out highlights yeah. from what I saw. I personally didn't need to see R5 again. I think it was enough to see him once, but I guess he, who else was going to show us the map of Tatooine? Do we see R5 anywhere outside the Mandalorian? Um, you see him in A New Hope, but that's about it when it comes to canon. Is that the, is that the first protocol droid that they buy that shorts out on him? Uh, the first Or not protocol, the uh, astro droid? Yeah. Okay. And then it blows up and then they get R2. Yeah. I, I didn't pick that up, but that's, uh, that's cool. That you can see the outline of the bad motivator. No one's ever cleaned it or repaired it since then. So, mm. yeah. But, yeah, KOTOR fans were blessed, in addition to the prequel fandom, with this episode, I would say, because literally I was like, oh, they're fighting a crate dragon on Tatooine. And where is its, where is its lair? Oh, in a cave. How did they decide to defeat it? with explosives and when they blow it up what do they find in the middle a crate dragon pearl and it's like i was like check 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 100 percent kotor canon you know i was very pleased by that yeah to be honest i can't remember much of tatooine and kotor so i was along for the ride on the mandalorian season two so i was i was watching a quick special done by eckhart's Le- i think it was eckhart's letter he had shown that the the worm does actually have arms and legs, so it's not technically a worm. There's like one little sequence where you can actually see the different appendages. But I mean if you're not if you're not looking, then it definitely just looks like a giant worm the whole time. Yeah. I mean it, it moved like a shark, but it did have the horns and stuff that did resemble the Kotor dragon, so there's just lots of different kinds of dragons. But then I was like, if they ever adapted KOTOR, they probably could do something similar, but people would think they were copying the Mandalorian. So they'd probably have to make it a bit different. So I was kind of thinking, like, in an adaptation, like, what if they had, like, three kind of smaller crate dragons, and then you can definitely see the Rakadin... Uh, star map ruins, you know, and maybe like the Rakadin or dark side influence kind of alters their behavior. I don't know. What would you do to kind of make a KOTOR adaptation kind of different from the Mandalorian? Like steering away from the dragon? How would you handle the Tatooine, like finding the star map, like handling oh. a st- like a dragon? Oh, um, that's a good question. Uh, because yeah, now now we have this this incident where uh, the Mandalorian did it first. That's it's tricky because I mean, other than other than the the Sarlacc, this is kind of like one of the big kind of king beasts that are very very established into kind of like the Tatooine like ecosystem, and so like I would hate. For them to use something like lesser, like a Sarlacc, um, especially because we've already seen that in Return of the Jedi, and it's not compelling it's... cinematically. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, kind of going back to some of my earlier comments about like how I'd handle a Kotor adaptation. I don't know. I don't know if I would want to have, for example, like a whole movie dedicated to like grabbing star map after star map to me that kind of sounds too much like a kind of like the percy jackson movie where it's just like a like a scavenger hunt for an hour um just kind of like picking up artifact after artifact until they they get themselves to hades uh so 
like I would I would definitely want to see a lot of planetary travel in Co- in like the Kotor Kotor films. But I don't know if I would if I would just rather simplify the the star map into just like one location or like two at the max with more like finding hints and not fragments of the star map if that makes sense especially because in the sequel trilogy you kind of have like the whole star map thing with uh r2d2 hiding a chunk of a map to find luke skywalker so we're also kind of dealing with and this is something i'm just thinking about too like we're also kind of dealing with well now the sequel trilogy is also done this plot first yeah I guess um, with KOTOR, though, it's kind of a connection to kind of an an ancient empire. So it's like they're finding ruins of something they don't know about. So I think that would be interesting. And, like, I'm fine having the different worlds still appear. Maybe it doesn't literally have to be each star map looks the same. And you can kind of switch it up so, like, each quest is different, you know? And just kind of serve the story have the setting serve the story like i i liked having kashik in the first movie and then have tatooine and manon appear in the second and then like korriban would be more about revan kind of discovering who he is but i mean we'll probably also... get to this later when we discuss the Tatooine levels on our podcast, but one thing yeah. I was thinking that could be changed is if Bastila runs into her mom, but she doesn't know her father's dead, so then she's just trying to find him, but then, like, kind of stumbles upon, like, his corpse, because, like, I guess in my mind, three dragons or two Great dragons smaller but kind of just a different fight and maybe it could even kind of mirror like Revan and Bastila's like approaches to the dark side just so it's like symbolically kind of telling a story and then like they defeat them but then maybe she finds the uh, corpse of her father and like has to deal with the holocron and like it could be a growing experience for her and like kind of develop that relationship you know but that's just me kind of thinking. Something to maybe like come across as more of a compromise too is instead of focusing so much on visiting each planet to find like the star map fragment, having that be the focus is have it more be about the like, yeah, the ruins, the the remnant ruins. And maybe they find something like the, different the, on each planet, like, but is a component to finding out like where the X on the map is. Yeah, like have the star map be well. The, obviously, the Star Forge be kind of like the the big X, but like just have the one star map. But maybe these different locations kind of like allude and talk about the uh, the location to like the the star map relative to also discussing like the other ancient sites. Yeah, and so kind of like the kind of having the full picture of the different sites then takes you to the star map which then takes you to the star forge something along those lines yeah just so it isn't just like finding the same artifact in what four different locations yeah and like sometimes the visions are kind of pretty much the same too i've been replaying kotor and i was like uh these visions seem samey you know visually you don't want to see the same thing four different times so well, that, just kind of make that, it look a bit different yeah maybe so like something with that though is he's kind of revisiting the same memory over and over again but each time he sees a little bit more and more as his memory kind of repairs but yeah definitely like simplify it so you're not you're not doing that every time you travel to the new planet but yeah it, it'll be cool to see what happens i i loved the episode i'm I'm excited to see what the rest of the season will bring, and I hope that they trend towards longer episodes. 
Like, sometimes Disney can kind of be a little bit of bean counters. Very cautious to see if something works. And the first season ended up working. And I hope we reap the benefit as fans. Like, and have longer episodes where more happens. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap things up. Then you can find us on Instagram at Ebon Hawk Podcast. And the Ebon Hawk can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts, as well as everywhere else that Anchor Podcasts are distributed. The best way to find our podcast is the link in the bio of our Instagram. And as I said, subscriptions, reviews, and shares help us out. And then our email is ebonhawkpodcast at gmail.com. Please email us your questions and business inquiries there. And then you can find me on uh, Twitch, Instagram, and uh, Twitter, just uh, searching for Conan Bon. Uh, if you want to talk to me live, though, uh, do so on Twitch, typically Thursday evenings. Our intro and outro themes were composed by Alistair Shorman. And he can be found on alistairsounds.wixsite.com forward slash Alistair Sounds. Our transition music was composed by Christian Walker, and he can be found at christianwalkermusic.com. Uh, this has been the Ebon Hawk Podcast. May the force be with you. We'll be back soon. Bye for now.